In this episode of Crime Investigation Australia, we look into the 30-year-old mystery disappearance of teenager Trudy Jeanette Adams. Trudy went missing, presumed murdered from here at Newport on Sydney's northern beaches in 1978. We'll examine evidence and we'll ask for your help because police now have new leads and they believe someone somewhere has information or knowledge about Trudy Adams' fate. That's later. But first, we look at the investigation into the heartless murder of a young mother, Donna Wheeler. The first Tuesday in November is when a nation stops to watch Australia's richest horse race, the Melbourne Cup. It's the one event where we all have a gamble on the outcome, when we all come together to shout our favourite across the line. In 1999, the Bart Cummings trained Rogan Josh wins the prestigious cup. 30-year-old Donna Wheeler, a resident of Barala in Sydney's west, has a $10 each way flutter on the winner. I still can't believe I doubled my money. Can't wait to tell Alan. Donna's celebration, however, will turn sour. She will fall victim to a ferocious attack that will end her short life. Her murder will be at the hands of a man obsessed, a man whose evil heart destroys what he can't have. It's Wednesday evening, the 3rd of November, 1999, the day after the Melbourne Cup. Donna Wheeler's former de facto John and their 12-year-old son, Alan, are concerned for Donna's well-being. I'm trying to find Donna. Have you seen her? As she yeah, was expected to collect her son okay. earlier that night. Okay, well look, if she turns up, get her to give me a call on the mobile. Donna would normally call by 4pm yeah. to check if Alan yeah, had chance. arrived home from school or if she was running late. Well, she's not down at the pub. Do you reckon she'll turn up somewhere? I had a phone call from a grandson asking me had I heard from her during the day and I said no. He rang me back a little bit later and he said if we can't find her, we've tried her mobile, Nobody's answering it. We just can't find her. Is she not there? Yeah, I've been calling her all day. She's not there. So I said, well, the best thing you can do is go to her home first. And the minute you get there, you'll know whether she's there by the car being in the driveway. And uh, he said, OK, I'll do that. I'll go to her house. And she said, go to her house first. Start there. Keep in touch. John and Alan find Donna's car parked in the carport. No, you just stay there, mate. Oh, come on, can't I come see Mum? I'll go and check on her myself. You got the keys there? When there's no answer at the door, John uses Alan's spare key and enters the house. As he walks inside the house, his worst fears are realised. And then the next phone call I got was just, um, we've gone into the house and, oh, Carol, she's been bashed. Oh, Carol, I think she's dead. I've tried to find a pulse. I'm not touching her, but I think she's dead. She was a um, really bright, sparky little thing. Very popular. Everybody liked her. She had lots of friends. Her biggest downfall, I think, was that she liked to become all the stray puppies, the poor little kids that mum and dad were separated or They've got a stepdad they don't like, those type of people. Donna was almost like a sister to me. Uh, yeah, she was a beautiful person, really caring, loving person. Oh, good mum. Uh, take us under the football every weekend. He played every year. And she was there to support him all the way. Uh, not just football, but other things that they might have done. You know, they were very close. Oh, she was lovely. She was a really nice girl, you know. We, we became really good friends. She, um, we both had come from a marriage breakdown, so, um, and we both had little boys, and we started up a friendship. I was staying at my boyfriend's house at the time, and he lived in Barala, which was uh, one of the next few streets of, to where Donna was living. And it was quite early in the morning, and my brother had gone past Donna's house and um, 
he'd seen police tape up around the house and came and advised me that um, he felt that something tragic had happened because there was police at um, Donna's house and there was tape up all around. The body of 30-year-old Donna Wheeler was found by her husband. She'd been stabbed to death. When we got inside, we found the body of Donna, Donna Wheeler, lying in the lounge room, semi-naked. She'd been stabbed and severely beaten around the head. Her clothing was either removed forcibly or, or there were some advances made to her for some type of, of, of a sexual nature. And it would appear that she's probably rejected the advances uh, and tried to repel the person. Struggles ensued, she's been stabbed to death, and the person simply left. The lounge room was in a bit of disarray. Um, I can recall seeing her body over in one corner of the room. She had a plastic bag around near her head that was bloodstained. There was a lot of blood staining on the wall, so obviously a, a vicious attack had occurred. Lying over in the other part of the room, we found a Stay Sharp knife, which was obviously the murder weapon, had blood on it, so that had been discarded by, by the killer. Over on the lounge chair, there was a, a towel that had blood stain on it, so it would appear to me that whoever had stabbed on her had, had washed or wiped their hands as well, so they've left something behind there, so we had a little bit to work with. But I think the thing that stood out to me at the time was the presence on the table inside the lounge room where there was a Chinese meal. So Donna had obviously been sitting talking to someone, but eating a meal at the time, so you had to assume that the person she was having the meal with was the killer. Police spend the first night collecting as much forensic evidence as possible from Donna Wheeler's house. That night, detectives speak with Donna's former de facto and father of her 12-year-old son. He's quickly eliminated as a suspect, but he does give police details about Donna's background, particularly about a person named Keith Bond. Police learn that Keith, also known as Tiny, had been charged with an assault on Donna, and she's recently taken out an apprehended violence order against him. Donna always let Keith know that it was never going to be anything uh, special. Uh, Donna um, was her own sort of person. I don't think she was looking for a, for a boyfriend or anything like that. She, uh, she'd done that and, uh, yeah, she was getting on with her own life and, uh, yeah, doing a good job of it. She didn't really say much about him. She said she wanted to just be his mate. He wanted a relationship really badly. And she said, she said to me that she kept telling him, I don't want to have another relationship. I've just come out of one and I am not ready for another relationship. Can we just be mates? And he'd say yes, and then he'd start, you know, and again a week later, I want to marry you, I want to have children with you, I'm in love with you. And she just kept that same point that she wasn't ready for that yet. And, um, and so she, I believe he hit her um, and broke her front tooth. And that's why she took the AVO out of him. It was a very tempestuous relationship. There was lots of arguments. Um, uh, they got on well at times, but then it became very, very violent. So obviously we had to focus our attention on, on the whereabouts of Keith because he was their next starting point. He's got a relationship that involves some violence. Keith was nowhere to be found, so he was our next port of call to find him. Early next morning, detectives visit Keith Bond's house. Knocked on the door, and, and I recall as I knocked on the door, it was answered by, uh, by Colin Bond, Keith's brother. Now, of course, we, we introduced ourselves and told us we were looking for Keith, and he told us that Keith wasn't there, and I said, well, we're here to talk about Donna Wheeler's death. He said, oh, I had a meal with Donna. We had some Chinese the other night. Of course, the pennies dropped. As soon as he started to mention, well, I had Chinese with you the other night, my attention then focused on, on Colin. Colin will have a lot more to say about the night Donna died, but it isn't only what Colin has to say that will raise police suspicions. It will be the detailed observations and quick actions by police that seal the fate of Donna Wheeler's killer. Uh, you just stay there, man. Oh, come on, can I come see Mum? I'll go and check on myself. You got the keys there? On the day after Melbourne Cup Day in 1999, 
30-year-old Donna Wheeler has been found murdered in her home at Barala in Sydney's west. Suspicion immediately falls on Keith Bond, a man she'd had a past violent relationship with. However, when police call to speak with Keith, they're met by his older brother, Colin, who admits to having had a Chinese dinner with Donna on the night of her murder. Now, at that time, I didn't know Colin. I certainly was looking for Keith, so I tapped on the door. Colin's answered it. I said, we're looking for Keith. He said, he's not here, he's at work. Uh, so he's invited us in the house. So I remember as we walked into the house, we saw some minute spots of blood in the house itself. So we've arranged for our crime scene people to come and, and make some examinations of, of that. And we sat in the lounge room and, and spoke with Colin. Now, I've noticed on Colin's hand, he had a small cut to his finger as well. And I've asked him, well, how did you cut your finger? And he said it was when he had some gardening. He was doing some gardening at the front of his house. With suspicion falling on Colin Bond, police move quickly, and he's taken to Flemington Police Station for further questioning. And what I propose to do is ask you a number of questions about uh, your knowledge of uh, <coughs> Don Wheeler and uh, any information you may have to assist us with our investigation. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. So Colin was taken back to the police station. We did an interview with him. Uh, he accounted for his movements at the time and gave us a version. Yes, they did it at a Chinese mill. In fact, he said about 7.30 or 8 o'clock, Donna got a phone call and she had to leave to go and meet someone. He said it was over some type of drug deal and he left. During this time, um, Donna got a phone call of someone that moved to a certain, certain place at um, Ashfield. Colin's probably inferring to us that the, the reason behind her death is from that phone call. So after, after Donna's left and she said she's gone off to Ashfield, I think she said, in yeah, response yeah, to Ashfield, yeah. do you know who the caller was that rang? Oh, we were the phone somewhere. Now, how did you get home that night? With Donna. And she, well, she dropped you home on the way? Yeah. So what time was that, do you recall? It's got to be, oh, I just, it's been about 9, 9.30, something like that. That day, police eventually locate Keith Bond and he's interviewed at Flemington Police Station. He tells police that his brother arrived home at around midnight on the Tuesday, then proceeds to have a shower and starts doing some washing. The laundry is next to Keith's bedroom and the sound of the washing machine and the dryer wakes him and his girlfriend. The fact that Colin would wash clothes late on the night of Donna's murder only raises more suspicions, especially as he also washed and dried a pair of runners. So what's prompted you to suddenly wash your clothes on a little cup day? Well, you know, it was just one of them things, man. I didn't have to work, so I thought I'd get me washing done. Okay. So where did you wash them? Whereabouts in the house did you? In your laundry room? Yeah, in the laundry room. Did you put any other clothes in with it or simply just those? Oh, uh, my jeans, um, socks, under jocks. And you don't recall what time that might have been? No. If I suggest to you that uh, that you washed around about midnight. What did? Midnight, yeah. What if I suggest to you that you might have in fact washed your clothes about midnight? What do you say about that? Not more of it, Well, do you normally wash clothes at midnight? Oh, yeah, I'm just going to water away. We're presently investigating the death of a girl called Donna Wheeler. And we're looking for any implements such as bloodstain cutting implements, bloodstain implements. Bloodstained clothing, any bloodstained cows, clothing, cleaning items, any property belonging to the deceased. So after we've done the interview with uh, with Colin, we've taken him back to their house at uh, at Regent's Park. At this stage, I've well, put in here and indicate here, looks like a dried blood spot there. At that stage, the house was, was under guard. Having seen the blood stain within the house, we, we obviously needed to, to search the house and to try and verify who the blood belonged to. Keith has just indicated this blood. He sees that it was caused when he injured himself last week. And nevertheless, we will take some swabs of those and compare it. If you prepare to supply blood samples, you So we've done a, a full analysis of the house forensically. We've gone through every bit piece that we could find. The blood, we even looked at the washing machines and other things that might have, if you had washed some clothing, might have been, been looked at. So we had to get the washing machine checked. And throughout the rest of the house, we've actually uncovered his clothing he wore at the time, which had all been washed. So they're the ones that you've washed on the, 
the Tuesday with your other washing. Mm. But the most crucial part about the, the search warrant was as we were talking to him, we noticed that he was wearing a watch. And on the watch you could see a very small portion of blood on the watch face. I'm just holding the watch that uh, Colin's taken off his wrist and, uh, and handed to me. Just some areas I just wanted to look at, maybe some blood areas on him within the watch itself. And inside I'm gonna, simply going to hand that to the scientific people now to uh, take a swab from. So during the search warrant, we've taken possession of his watch. It's been swabbed in his presence by our crime scene officers. Uh, it's come up to the presence of blood. Just a positive reaction to blood on the, uh, on the watch band there. What I propose to do, Colin, is take possession of your watch. No worries. No, did you understand that? That's all we had on Colin at the, at the time. We weren't able to prove anything beyond that. So then the work now involves us now testing his story, going back to interview the people, going back to the club where they said they, they were at during the night, interviewing all the, the barmaids and the other people within the club. Most crucially is the timing of the purchase of the Chinese meal, when in fact we can show it was sometime later on. And we could even show that the phone call that, it, that she received around about 7.30 or so, we were able to interview that person and, and verify the time that that occurred. Police establish that on the day of the Melbourne Cup, Donna Wheeler finishes work and arrives at the Regent's Park Hotel after six o'clock that night. Hi Donna, how are you going? Good, how are you going? Good. She meets up with yeah. Colin Bond, who's sitting at the bar yeah, and has been in the hotel for most of the day. Thanks, Rhonda. The evening before, Donna had given Colin some money to place a bet on the Melbourne Cup. So did you see the race? I did, where's my winnings? When she arrives at the hotel, Colin hands over her winnings. Thank you. Donna and Colin are friends, but it appears their friendship has become closer since she ended her volatile relationship with his brother Keith just a few weeks earlier. Thanks, Colin. Donna sits with Colin for a while, drinking and talking, before they both head off to the Regent's Park Bowling Club. While playing the poker machines with Colin, Donna then gets a call. Hi, John. It's from John, her former de facto. Yeah. What for? He needs to borrow money from Donna. How much? No, no, that's fine. And arranges a meeting Where place in nearby Strathfield, not far from Barala. Um, yeah, I think I know how to get there. Yep, yep She tells fine. John she hasn't had dinner yet. No, no, no. I'm getting takeaway Chinese. And she'll order okay. her takeaway Chinese and then meet okay, with I him. I guess I can be there in about 15 minutes. It's Donna's intention to then pick up her meal on her way home. Okay, see you soon. <sighs> What's he want? He wants money. I'll be back. Can you get the Chinese? Yeah, okay. See ya. This is the only call police find on Donna's phone records for that evening. Witnesses testify that they remember seeing Colin sometime later back at the hotel. He's sitting at the bar with a plastic bag containing a takeaway from the hotel's Chinese bistro. After her meeting with John, Donna returns to the Regent's Park Hotel, picks up Colin, takes the food, and then drives straight to her house. Oh, just up here around the corner. Yeah, it was fine. It shouldn't take too long. Just pop it down on the table and I'll grab some cutlery. Once inside her Barala house, she leaves Colin waiting with the food in the lounge room as she goes to get cutlery and two bowls. So lucky. Donna returns. She no sooner places the bowls on the small table when, based on the physical evidence, police believe Colin makes his move. Oh, Colin, don't be silly. Let's eat. Donna, give us a kiss. Colin? Donna, give us Colin, a kiss. Colin, what are you doing? Donna, give us a kiss. Colin! Donna, give us a kiss. Colin, piss off! Donna rejects him. Colin! But this only angers him and he strikes out, hitting her about the head.
He then goes to the kitchen, takes a knife, and returns, stabbing her. I think Donna's attack was very quick, in that she was simply attacked in a rush, beaten and stabbed in a matter of minutes. After he's finished, he tosses the knife across the room and wipes his hand on a towel. So realistically, she may not have screamed, but she may not have come to the attention of the neighbours. So to say that neighbours didn't hear anything probably doesn't surprise you, in fact, because there may not have been anything to hear. I think she was just overwhelmed in the attack. Whether Colin intended to rape Donna is unclear. There are no signs of sexual assault, but he does leave her naked from the waist down. Police are sure they're chasing the right man, that Colin Thomas Bond is the person who murdered Donna Wheeler. But if there were any doubts, a quick check of Colin's background soon strengthens their case. Colin had only just been released from jail within the previous 12 months. Now, he'd been uh, charged uh, with the murder of a young woman uh, over at the Bankstown area. He was convicted of manslaughter and he was received a 20 year sentence. He served 10 years. So after 10 years, he's, he's now released. And within the 12 months, a very similar things occurred uh, with Donna Wheeler. The first lady that, he'd, uh, that he killed had obviously rejected his advances to her and she'd been bludgeoned to death not unlike what happened to Donna Wheeler. I didn't like him because I'd heard that he killed somebody. She had to. Um, I said to her to be really careful of him because of that. She, no, 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 he's explained it all to me, Mum. It was just, he just pushed this woman and she fell and hit her head and she died. That was what she believed. Even patrons at the Regent's Park Hotel share police suspicions. The following day, he was uh, barred from the local hotel, and um, when I seen him, it confirmed my suspicions that it was Colin. He had um, bloodied and bruised knuckles, and uh, I confronted him and asked him, have you heard about Donna? And he, he was acting very strange and uh, said, you know, was stating how bad it was, and I asked him straight out what happened to his knuckles, and he said he uh, got into a fight the night before at the uh, bowling club. Uh, everyone knew it was Colin. Some people decided that they were um, not going to admit it, whether they knew it or not. Uh, everyone knew who it was. Sorry I took so long. What took you? What? John wanted to talk about a few things. And I Colin was the last person to be seen with Donna. There was uh, other stuff. Uh, Keith had an alibi. Keith had a girlfriend with him. Colin come home and washed his clothes at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock in the morning, woke the whole house up. Uh, Keith and Colin had an argument that night over why are you using the washing machine at this time of the night. So people that were in the group knew. Some weeks before Donna's murder, Cherie Hegarty saw Colin's evil side. Um, well, we'd gone back to the house and um, he attempted to have more than a friendship with me that particular night. And um, I obviously wasn't interested and I'd stated no. And he, um, he became very volatile and aggressive. It was, um, it was an evil look. It was uh, the look in his eye. It, was, um, it wasn't a normal relationship with rejection. It was, um, you know, it, it was dangerous. In spite of Colin Bond's previous criminal record, police need strong evidence if they're to arrest him for Donna Wheeler's murder. With no witnesses and certainly no confession, their only hope rests on the results of the blood samples. For police, it's now a waiting game. 
But will the results support their theory and reveal Colin as Donna Wheeler's murderer? Thirty-year-old Donna Wheeler has been bashed and stabbed to death in her home at Barala on the night of the Melbourne Cup 1999. The prime suspect is 50-year-old Colin Thomas Bond. Police learn Colin has recently been released from prison after serving 10 years of a 20-year sentence for manslaughter. It was alleged he killed a woman after she rejected his advances. Police now fear he's done it again, and Donna is his victim. Shit. Colin was first interviewed on the 4th of November, and that was the first time we committed him to a version. Now, that, at that time, I'd met him at the house. We'd taken him back. We'd done a, a searching type of interview with him. And he gave me his movements and said about some things. But at that time, I didn't have enough evidence to, to charge him. And I think it was around about the 15th of November when we finally get information that they found a bloodied fingerprint on the plastic bag where her head lay. Indicative of, the, of the, had to be the killers. And so all of a sudden we get his fingerprint identified within the crime scene, that's sufficient enough for me to go and arrest him. And they were able to match the blood of Colin on a towel. Now the, the towel was actually inside the murder scene, it was on, on the lounge chair near where her body lay. So obviously after he stabbed her, He's washed his hands and he's used the towel to wipe his, his blood-stained hands. So the cut on his finger left the blood on the towel. And some weeks later on, we were advised that the blood that was on the watch was in fact Donna Wheeler's. So this is it. This is the defining moment in this case. Is that now, as well as the fingerprinting blood by Colin near her head, we now we've got Donna's blood on his watch, the watch that he wore at the time of the murder. So Colin's come home and washed his clothing and had a shower. So he's rinsed himself of all the blood. But the most crucial part is that he's taken his watch off to have a shower. When he's got out of the shower, he's put his watch back on. Unbeknown to him, he's got blood on the watch. I just, I got there just as they were putting him in the wagon. Once he was arrested and he knew he was gone, uh, just very uh, solemn, isn't it? Like, it was like he knew, and he didn't have to talk to anyone anymore. He didn't have to, he knew he was gone. Colin provides a, a version to us. Talks about going to the club with Donna, uh, buying the Chinese meal, coming back to the house to have the Chinese meal. But crucially, he says that uh, Donna got a phone call and she had to leave the house to go and meet someone. And you're saying that during the Chinese meal, the phone rang, and then Donna yeah. shortly after yeah. left. We looked at the phone calls on Donna's phone and it showed that at a certain time she received this phone call and she did meet with somebody. And then she's come back and had the Chinese meal with Colin. Now, what, what did she tell you she had to do with that phone call? She had to go to Ashfield and meet someone. Meet someone at Ashfield. Mm. Did she say who it was? No. So what he's trying to say that Donna's left the house to meet somebody else, obviously to meet the killer, and I've gone home. Well, where did she take you to once, once she... Home. When in fact we were able to show that, in fact, that phone call happened at another time, and now Colin was certainly in her presence eating the Chinese meal when this murder occurred. Okay, we were able to show yeah, that the, the purchase of the, of the Chinese meal was made at the club, certainly after this phone call, and certainly made in the presence of Colin. So once we were able to, to tell him, say, well, listen, we can show evidence that at a certain time, you're seen in, in the company of Donna at the club. Oh, just up here around the corner. At a certain time, we can show you coming home where Keith is, and Keith is able to show what time you come home by yourself. So these are the crucial times to you. And once we started to narrow him into a, to a time gap, around about an hour, it's at that point that he realised that he, he's got no answer. So what I'm suggesting to you now is that between, you say you got home at around about 9.30, the other side, they've got to hammer in about 10.30. Oh. What have you done for this hour? I don't know. As I said, I was pretty drunk. This was Melbourne Cup day. I've been drinking all day. And where did you go? Well, no.
I am, brother. Give me, give me bear street. Something in the visual, give me a bear street. Startling. We, we had no eyewitnesses to, to the crime. We had no people that heard anything. So you're simply relying upon the version that Collins provided, the version that Keats provided, and that's what you've got to work with. And then at the same time, you've got your forensic thing that's going to tie it all in together. So as far as any, any startling witnesses, no, there wasn't. It was simply the case of, of trying to develop relationships between the two, trying to work out reasons why, interpreting what you had within your crime scene, and really taking advantage of, of what physically is at your scene to work with. And it's the forensics at the scene that, that really solved, solved this case. Colin faces trial for the murder of Donna Wheeler. During the trial, his previous manslaughter conviction is ruled inadmissible, so the jury must reach its verdict based only on the circumstantial evidence. The jury wasn't out for very long. We didn't know whether that was good or bad, but they came back with a guilty verdict. And so I just said, oh, rot in hell. I was just like, just got it out. I was happy then, I was, got it out, I've said it. And he just looks at you with this smug look on his face. He's just smug and arrogant all the way. Before a sentence is handed down, the judge instructs the jury to stay and listen while Colin Bond's criminal history is read out. So the prosecutor, uh, Barry Newport, has got up and, and, and whilst the jury was present, started to read through the criminal history of this man. And it was at the point when he described the killing of the first lady that he was convicted for for manslaughter. Chillingly close to what happened to Donna Wheeler. You could see the eyes of the jury, you could see that they realised that the decision they made was the correct one. Colin Thomas Bond is sentenced to 30 years jail with a non-parole period of 25 years. Colin's denied involvement throughout this all the way through even in the, in the face of overwhelming evidence. We've got DNA evidence, we've got fingerprint evidence, we've got uh, other witnesses that see him do certain things after the event. So in the face of overwhelming evidence, he's still got the, the right to maintain uh, innocence. Colin will be in his late 70s before he's eligible for parole. However, soon after arriving at Lithgow Jail, his evil heart turns on him and he dies of a heart attack. Had no problem with him dying in jail, but at least he'd never do what he'd been doing again, ever. But I would have liked to have, to have served, you know, probably until the day before he was due to be released and have the heart attack then. That would have suited me just fine. When we return, we'll look at the mysterious disappearance of 18-year-old Trudy Adams, who was last seen alive hitchhiking here on Sydney's northern beaches in June 1978. Trudy's disappearance sparked a massive search and uncovered other victims who'd been abducted and raped and who are lucky to be alive. Sydney's northern beaches stretch for roughly 30 kilometres from Manly all the way up to Palm Beach. During the 70s, it was commonplace for young women and men to hitchhike between suburbs or even just a few metres to each other's homes, the beach, the local clubs and hotels. Thumbing a ride was a substitute for poor public transport and the expense of taxis. Being a close community, most hitchhikers found lifts from people they knew, but there were always those that risked going with strangers. This easygoing culture and the trusting nature of young people living on the northern beaches would prove to be an ideal hunting ground for sexual predators. <laughs> On Saturday, June 24th, 1978, 18-year-old Trudy Jeanette Adams was excited about an upcoming holiday to Bali. She left her home at 7 p.m. and spent the evening with friends at the Newport Arms Hotel. At 10 o'clock, Trudy and a friend move on to the Newport Surf Lifesaving Club.
Shortly after midnight, Trudy decides to leave the club, telling no one that she was leaving or where she was going. At the club was a former boyfriend, Steve Norris. He sees Trudy from the club, walking through the car park. Knowing she's going to hitchhike, Steve follows her, hoping to catch up and see her home safely. As he makes his way towards her, he sees a light brown or beige Holden panel van with no side windows pull up beside Trudy. The car obscures his vision, but when it drives away, Trudy is gone. He looks out for a lift, and when one arrives, they try and follow the panel van. But it's too late, the panel van has vanished. Trudy lived just six minutes away from the Newport Surf Lifesaving Club but didn't arrive home and has never been seen since. At the top of the stairs, there's a window and I saw Trudy walking, heading across uh, Barangeri Road. And I knew straight away she'd be hitchhiking. And that's when I, I actually went down to follow her, uh, well, just to, to get to her. But as I've come down the stairs and looked up towards Neptune Road where she was, this panel van pulled over. And when it drove off, she wasn't there. So she's obviously got the lift. And I hitchhiked straight away because I wanted to make sure she got home safely. And anyway, I remember we were at a party the next day, a barbecue the next day, just around the corner of Trudy's place. And normally she'd be there. And this is when the shit hit the fan that she hadn't come home. And we all knew something about happened. But even up to that moment, we still, I still wasn't overly concerned. I mean, you know, you're a little bit, but not overly concerned. There's lots of friends that she knows in the area, and she would have called in and seen somebody possibly. Or it didn't hit me hard that night at all. Trudy's family quickly contact local police and a full investigation swings into action. What do you think happened to Trudy? Well, I, uh, at this stage, uh, I entertain the gravest doubts as to her being alive. Fearing the worst, the Homicide Squad is also contacted. The Homicide Squad was called on for matters that uh, were looking at being protracted or matters of importance. Um, and not necessarily a straight out homicide. So in this instance, when local police learnt that uh, she had disappeared under the circumstances reported, we immediately considered that it was a, uh, uh, highly likely there was a homicide, so we were called in straight away. I would like anyone that could give any information whatsoever to do so, either a car that bouldering in front of, noticed her, going towards Palm Beach to contact the Mona Vale police urgently. Time is running out. Uh, we attempted to retrace steps and get information um, from the local people. There was a huge amount of publicity at the time uh, with, in relation to her disappearance and absolutely hundreds of calls were coming in which had to be addressed. Well, uh put you in groups and attach a policeman with you. Creek area, yeah, we do that in the four-wheel drives. Number one was to try um, uh, and search the area from where she was last seen um, to her home. Um, so we utilised other members of the uh, homicide and um, also the uh, search and rescue of local people. Um, I remember some of the family and friends were all part of the search. Uh, at the same time, trying to locate as many people as possible who may have been in the vicinity of the, um, of the Newport Surf Club. Trying to get a background on, on her, uh, taking possession of items that may allowed to be used for, in scientific um, matters. Even uh, to this day, if she's located, the body's located, um, uh, we should be able to identify her by things that were taken at the time for DNA, even though it didn't exist in our time.
We circulated um, a description of a, a vehicle that was she was seen going into. Um, we had no information that she was abducted off the side of the road. Um, our information was that perhaps she went with them uh, on her own accord, and if that was the case, that, that she would have known them. And in fact, Steve even went to the extent of uh, undergoing hypnosis um, with our um, police hypnotist um, to try and get more information in relation to the vehicle. And even though a little bit more was forthcoming, it was insufficient to identify it. The hypnosis thing, they just wanted to get me to really focus on the van and everything I pretty much said on the van was right, but the number plate, and I think I remember saying that it was black and yellow, uh, like a New South Wales plate, but I couldn't see the plate and I really tried to concentrate on it, but couldn't see the plate. So it didn't really bring up any more than what I'd already said. Despite retracing Trudy's movements on the night she disappeared, no one finds anything to reveal what's happened to her. Then, five days after Trudy was last seen alive, police and her family each receive an anonymous call. These phone calls will shift the investigation into a whole new direction and confirm everybody's worst fears. June 24, 1978, 18-year-old Trudy Adams is hitchhiking along Baron Joey Road after spending an evening at Newport Surf Lifesaving Club on Sydney's northern beaches. She's seen by her former boyfriend, Steve Norris, getting into a beige or light brown Holden panel van with no side windows. It's the last anyone ever sees her. Police, family members, friends and volunteers search the immediate area, trying to find some trace or clue as to Trudy's disappearance. Trudy herself was a very attractive, well-liked young lady, and we found nothing that would suggest that she was involved in any criminality or, or drugs or otherwise, uh, apart from the usual youthful uh, experiences um, in, those, in that era. Also sweeping through the bush, Charles Adams, Trudy's father, who now says he's prepared to accept the worst, there with police, in case any identification may be necessary. Trudy, look, I mean, I can say this honestly and comfortably, that she was, um, she liked having fun and, like, and liked and enjoyed the party scene and the whole thing, but if anybody would do anything to her that she didn't want, she would punch and kick and scream. On Thursday, June 29th, five days after Trudy disappeared, an anonymous caller contacts both Trudy's family and the police. The caller doesn't say much, but his message is very clear. He says that Trudy is dead and that her body can be found along Mona Vale Road, which leads inland and is surrounded by national parklands. He tells the family and the police, quote, it was an accident. If he said it was an accident, well, all right, but please come forward. We used to get so much information, you know, would, would, would come in and, that, uh, and the majority of it would be genuine. Um, we've had others similar who have said, if you go to a certain spot, you'll find a certain article that was used. Um, and sometimes, you know, you say you, we don't know whether it's going to be true or not, and it turns out that it is. So for, for a person to contact both um, the parents and the police also, then obviously they had information that they wanted to, to pass on, so it may well be of the, the truth. Police are convinced the telephone calls were not from a sadistic hoaxer, and a coordinated search was underway at first light this morning. So we called out uh, Detective Sergeant Alan Herman uh, in those days, who was on the homicide squad, and. He and his partner, Steve McCann, 
um, took over a, a mammoth surging of that area, the Terry Hills, and uh, we extended it for, for days and days. There were, uh, I think there was a class of young police that just joining young trainees, I think they were utilised also. So we did as much as possible to try and locate the uh, a, a body as we believed that it would be by then. Police utilise the media, who've been printing front page stories about Trudy since the day she was reported missing. Through the media, police ask people to contact them with any information, and what they get is more than they bargained for. We then found out that there was instances of um, girls being abducted. Um, we sought assistance from the public and a number of girls came forward uh, to say that they had been uh, abducted and raped. Eight girls come forward and tell police that they'd been picked up hitchhiking on Baron Joey Road and raped. Well, nobody knew about any of those rapes or what have you until Trudy disappeared. That's when they, all these girls came forward. A ninth girl explains she was abducted while waiting for a bus. On each occasion, the, uh, the women were uh, picked up by two males um, in different vehicles. Once in the car, they were confronted um, with a handgun. Um, they were, their eyes were taped and they were handcuffed. They were then driven uh, to a location which we would believe up on Manavale Road uh, where they were sexually assaulted. They were violent sexual assaults that were undertaken. Police believe two men aged about 30 years and of Caucasian appearance are responsible for the rapes and the disappearance of Trudy Adams. At times the male offenders uh, change their appearance to try and in an endeavour to hide their identities. These girls, and I remember the uh, police were telling me this, that they were picked up, raped, taken back to where they lived because they had their wallets and they'd drop them off, virtually kick them out of the car, throw their wallets at them and say, we know where you live, keep your mouth shut. And that's why these girls virtually were in fear. And this is what I've heard. And I knew out of the six or eight, I knew three or four of the girls and they were girls from around the peninsula. Even though police have two suspects, there is insufficient evidence. And the investigation into Trudy Adams has wound down. Interestingly, since Trudy's disappearance, the abductions and the rapes have stopped. I didn't want vengeance. I just wanted to know what happened to her. To say it's a mother's privilege or something, I don't know. But it's a very hard entry. And it's at the back of my mind every minute of the day. What happened to Trudy remains a mystery for 30 years. Then, in July 2008, the New South Wales Unsolved Homicide Team reopens the case, citing new evidence. They also offer a $250,000 reward to anyone with information leading to an arrest. Uh, this girl's been missing for 30 years. Uh, her family would be desperate to know uh, her whereabouts and certainly are keen to bring some closure. Uh, and of course, as investigators, we're very keen to um, bring the perpetrators to justice. Well, we're hoping not only for victims to come forward to provide that critical piece of information, but we're also hoping that um, an accomplice, uh, because we believe that whilst uh, on each occasion there was at least two males, um, those, the, the composition of those two males may have changed with another accomplice. Um, if That may very well be the case that an accomplice, um, whatever happened to Trudy on the night she disappeared, has knowledge, has knowledge of where the, the body of Trudy may be, or has knowledge of the circumstances of the event, and uh, we encourage them to come forward. Anyone that does come forward now, um, there, there may be matters that, forensic-wise, that were retained at the time, which can be, uh, with new technology, can assist corroborate what they're saying. Um, so it's important that they, police have at least a, a significant lead to um, use this new technology. Uh, and without that, if they don't uh, come forward, well, then we can't do it. People do assume that things are insignificant um, and their, their matter might not be important. But we have a bigger picture of the events and that little piece of information they have might fit into the, the, the larger jigsaw, if I could put it that way, 
which may, uh, may progress this investigation. I've been buoyed a little bit by information just recently that, uh, you know, it's again a um, matter of investigation and I hope the young blokes that are doing it, are, you know, have a success. I'd like a closure myself. For 30 years, every time I hear radio and something they found some bones, my heart stops a couple of beats every time. But, you know, it's never anything's ever found, but you just want something to be found. Police would like to hear from anyone with any information about the abductions and rapes or Trudy's disappearance. All calls are strictly confidential. If you know anything, contact your local police station or call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. I think it'd be very good to see justice is brought about and uh, I'll be very happy for that to happen.